Welcome to the public webinar series at Tokyo College um, International Institute for Advanced Study at the University of Tokyo. My name is Naoko Shimazu. I'm professor at, at this um, institute and I'm a historian. And uh, I will be moderating the web webinar today. Before we start, um, this today's webinar will be conducted in English. And I'd like to draw your attention for Japanese speakers um, to the availability of simultaneous interpretation in Japanese. Please click the translation button at the bottom of the screen, which looks like a globe, in order to switch to Japanese. Also for the Q&A session, please post your questions in English or Japanese in the chat box on the screen. Now, allow me to introduce today's speakers, or panelists, rather. Um, a speaker is John Driffle, uh, who is a visiting professor at Yale NUS College in Singapore, which he joined in 2016. He was educated at the University of Cambridge and Princeton University. He has worked at a number of universities, including the University of Southampton, Tilburg University in the Netherlands, Queen Mary and Westfield College, University of London, and Birkbeck College, University of London. Among many shorter spells as a visitor at various institutions in Sweden, Denmark, the Bank of England, um, Queen's University in Canada, in 1999, he spent three months as a visiting fellow at the University of Tokyo's Faculty of Economics. Professor Driffel was a member of the Council of the Royal Economic Society between 2000 to 2005 and on its executive committee uh, for four of uh, those years. He has also been specialist advisor to the House of Lords Select Committee on the European Union, Subcommittee A on Economic Affairs for Inquiries into the Euro and the Stability and Growth Pact. From 2004 to 2010, uh, Professor Driffel was the director of the Economic and Social Research Council, ESRC, uh, of the United Kingdom and its World Economy and Finance Program. More recently, from 2011 to 2016, he was the head of the Department of Economics at Birkbeck College. Professor Driffel was a fellow of the Center for Economic Policy Research from 1985 until 2020, and is a fellow of CES EFO Research Network. From 2012 to 2019, he was a member of CES EFO European Economic Advisory Committee. Now to comment, we have Stomu Watanabe, who is Professor of Economics of the Graduate School of Economics at the University of Tokyo. He received his PhD in economics from Harvard University in 1992 and did his undergraduate work at the University of Tokyo. Uh, Professor Watanabe's main research area is monetary policy and inflation dynamics. He is the author of many books and more than 70 academic journal articles on monetary policy, inflation dynamics, and international finance. He was the project leader of three previous JSPS grant in aid for scientific research projects inflation dynamics in the Japanese economy, an approach integrating macro, microeconomic behaviors and aggregate fluctuations, which took place between 2006 to 2011, and another one between 2012 and 2017, understanding persistent deflation in Japan, and also between 2018 to 2018, 2023, central bank communication design and is project leader of the current JSPS granting aid for scientific research project on chronic deflation in Japan, causes, consequences, and welfare implications. And this will go on uh, until 2028. In addition, he has developed the Nikkei University of Tokyo Daily Price Index with Kota Watanabe and is principal founder of Nowcast Inc Incorporated. So Professor Drifo will speak today on the social and behavioral turn in macroeconomics. Without further ado, I shall pass the floor on to you, John. 
Okay, thank you, Naka. I hope uh, the slides have appeared in front of everyone. Thank you very much uh, to Tokyo College. Thank you, Naka, for kind introduction. It's a pleasure to um, uh, be able to be here today to speak on this uh, on this topic. Um, the social and behavioral turn in macroeconomics. And the question is really whether there is one, whether there has been one, or whether, and whether there's likely to be one. <clears throat> so let me begin. Um, there's an enormous literature on social and behavioral economics, beginning as far back as 1943 with Herbert Simon's University of Chicago PhD thesis, in which he started to set out the theory of bounded rationality and satisficing behavior. Behavioral economics draws on research in psychology, sociology, anthropology, and other fields to describe and model people's behavior with descriptive realism. And it generally stands in contrast to the notion of rational behavior that dominates mainstream economics. There are many, many examples of this, and let me um, list a few. Um, so notoriously, people are very bad at planning, for the, at planning for the future. They do it, but do it so imperfectly. They tend to save too little and regret it later. Similarly, people on the whole are not good at dealing with risk and uncertainty. Low probability events are often treated as if they will not happen at all, while other risks are magnified. The equity premium is a long-standing macroeconomic pu puzzle that reflects this. The question is, why has the return on equities been so much higher than the return on fixed income securities in the long run? Equities are riskier, but not enough to rationalize the historical difference in return. Um, thirdly, people exhibit present uh, bias, uh, gambler's fallacy, and the narrative fallacy, as Nassim Taleb um, uh, elaborated in his book, The Black Swan. Um, fourthly, the way choices are framed affects um, decisions, framing affects decisions. Uh, the take of insurance, for example, depends on whether people have to opt in or opt out. They're much likely, much more likely to accept the default option. Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler devote their book, Nudge, to this phenomenon. Governments have taken up these ideas in designing public policy. People are prone to the anchoring effect in which decisions are made relative to some reference point which may be irrelevant, but nevertheless affects decisions. This is a point made by um, Kahneman and Tversky. People, uh, people are concerned about fairness. Um, in laboratory experiments, when people are required to play a game where player A has a sum of money and has to offer some of it to player B, if B accepts the offer, they both get to keep the money. If um, A keeps what is left over after giving B his share and B gets what was offered. But if B refuses the offer, they each get nothing. It's repeatedly found in these experiments that if uh, A offers B less than 50%, the offer is refused, even though the person refusing the offer loses as well as the person making it. On the other hand, uh, people um, cooperate in games, even when strictly rational play rules our cooperation out. This happens in the repeated prisoner dilemma game and in the so-called centipede game. Faced with complex situations, people use rules of thumb to guide decisions. They may use mental accounting, using money from different sources in different ways, like using gambling winnings, for example, to pay for treats and holidays while using your salary for basic necessities. Uh, people follow social norms of behavior in hours of work, holidays, spending, um, and, and so on, rather than making uh, careful decisions all the time. Um, investment, investors in financial markets um, appear to be given to, they appear to be susceptible to irrational exuberance, bidding up prices beyond reason. Uninformed investors may follow the herd, expecting more price increases. Expert investors then may invest in the belief that the uninformed traders will continue to bid up the price, and hence um, bubbles are likely to form in financial markets. Investors may be propelled by animal spirits, self-sustaining sense of optimism. People's behavior may be affected by the stories and the narratives they exchange concerning the economy rather than objective facts. Robert Schiller, for example, speaks of narrative economics in a, in a recent lecture and a recent book. And another thing that happens in financial markets is that people selectively hear arguments with which they agree 
and they discount evidence and arguments that contradict their prior beliefs. They exhibit so-called confirmation bias. Financial analysts believe the arguments put about by their peers that high stock prices are justified by faster growth and lower risks. Uh, and the, these arguments were elaborated by um, Gillian Tett in her, um, an influential book on the um, global financial crisis called Fool's Gold. And also my colleague Anne Seibert um, wrote an entertaining account of sexism in the city, um, describing the um, shenanigans um, among um, young male um, investment analysts uh, during the financial crisis. Um, con <clears throat> consumers' behavior um, uh, is, is affected by advertising and by fads and fashions, forecasts and rumors influence spending plans. The disappearance of toilet paper and canned food at the start of the COVID pandemic is an example. And lastly, too much uh, economics, um, in my view, ig ignores altruistic behavior, actions driven by ethical and social concerns and, con social and concerns for the welfare of others. And it tends to be ignored in much of mainstream um, macroeconomics. Okay, so th that's a, a, a long list of, um, so not exhausted by any means, of some of the um, aspects of behavioral economics. Um, so th may I say then, the, the aim of this talk is to, is to sketch the way that macroeconomics has developed over the years, to review some of the key ideas from behavioral economics and to consider the place that behavioral economics might find in macro in the years to come. Despite compelling evidence for the practical relevance of many of the ideas that make up behavioral economics, it hasn't really made great inroads into the predominant macroeconomic paradigms of the day. It remains largely a collection of interesting ideas and facts about behavior of individuals, firms, and markets uh, that do not fit into the standard theorist the story, but it has not yet offered a sufficiently coherent alternative to it to significantly alter or replace the status quo. Despite many acknowledged shortcomings, the mainstream paradigm has proved remarkably robust. The core idea of rational behavior exerts a firm grip on economics. Now the question is, will behavioral economics behavioral be able to dislodge it in, in, the, in the future? I understand that this talk is meant to address an audience drawn from many disciplinary backgrounds, not just economics, and indeed principally not economics, and with varying degrees of interest in it. So I apologize to any fellow economists, academic economists who might be listening who feel that I'm rehearsing some well-known facts and arguments. My, well, my immediate interest in the topic and wish to share some thoughts on it stem from my working with two colleagues, Christopher Tsukis of Kiel University in the UK and Frederick Tournemain of Chulalongkorn University Bangkok on a book on social and behavioral macroeconomics, which we hope will be published soon. And my thanks to Chris, I'd like to express my thanks to Chris and Frederick for their help with this talk. Although of course I and not they are responsible for any errors and omissions. So let me, um, let me turn to um, mac a quick sketch of macroeconomics and um, uh, macroeconomic um, development um, over the years, because there's been a kind of um, a cycle I think, in um, uh, play in the development of the subject. Uh, the pendulum has swung first one way and perhaps is swinging back um, in the other direction now. Um, just to set out the stage again, macroeconomics is the area of the subject that tries to understand the fluctuations of the economy as a whole, the growth of gross domestic product, the ups and downs of the rate of unemployment, the rate of inflation, movements of interest rates, exchange rates, the amount of imports and exports, the balance of payments, government spending, tax revenues, public borrowing, public debt, and so on. It stands in contrast with microeconomics, which examines the behavior of individual persons or households, firms, small and large, and markets. Microeconomics leads to a bottom-up approach to economic questions, starting at by looking at small units and working up to bigger ones. Whereas um, macroeconomics, or at least it was in the early days of the subject, is more top down, starting with the aggregate. It came into being in 1936 
with the publication by the British economist John Maynard Keynes of his book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest and Money in 19... Uh, the book was a response to the Great Depression of the 1930s, a decade of unprecedented turmoil and chaos, when 25% of the workforce of the United States, for example, were unemployed, many businesses went bust and thousands of banks collapsed and there was widespread poverty and destitution and the United Kingdom and continental Europe was similarly ravaged by the uh, depression. But based on their understanding and the, of the causes of the depression, um, the um, uh, public officials at the time in the US and the UK and other countries prescribed policies that would have made the situation worse, not better. Andrew Mellon, the Treasury Secretary at the time, was opposed to government intervention. He, this is the, the, he was the US Secretary of the Treasury, I should say. He believed that recessions were a necessary part of the business cycle because they purged the economy. He advocated that firm, firms should, and I quote, liquidate labor, liquidate stocks, liquidate the farmers, liquidate real estate purge the rottenness out of the system. High costs of living and high living will come down. Enterprising people will pick up the wrecks from less competent people. End of quote from Andrew Mellon. The British Treasury believed that higher public spending paid for by the government borrowing money would only cause lower investment by firms and have no beneficial effect on the economy. Consequently, they advocated balanced budgets and letting the recession run its course. Those arguments were based on the conventional wisdom of the time, which drawn long established microeconomic principles. The general theory was an attempt to provide theoretical underpinnings for policies of public spending, tax cuts, and government borrowing to increase total spending in the economy and bring down unemployment. In doing this, Keynes's arguments turned several pre key preconceptions upside down. It was a radical assault on conventional economic wisdom, and it met with determined opposition. So macroeconomics has been from the start a contested field. Keynes argued that the conventional economics of the time might be appropriate to the long run after the effects of shocks to the economy had died, had dissipated and the economy had returned to its long run equilibrium state. He wanted an analysis that had something useful to say about the short run as well. In the tract on monetary reform of 1923, he had written, quotes, economists set themselves too easy, too useless a task. If in tempestuous seasons, they can only tell us that when the storm is past, the ocean is flat again, end of quote. He also perhaps more famously said, <clears throat> in the long run, we're all dead. In time, um, the general theory became widely accepted um, the it became the general, the conventional wisdom in its turn, and indeed dominated macroeconomics in the 1950s and 60s, when policies of public spending and taxation based on it appeared to deliver stable growth, low unemployment, and low inflation. There were decades of prosperity and development. The French speak of les trente glorieuses, 30 years between 1945, 1975, and the British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan said in 1957, you've never had it so good. And of course, those were the decades within which the Japanese economy grew by leaps and bounds uh, and, be, and became one of the most prosperous in the, in the world. Um, now let me say something about behavioral elements in the general theory. Keynes had achieved his remarkable turnaround in thinking by making some key assumptions that in retrospect look like behavioral models, installing them in his analysis in place of cherished tenets of what he called classical economics. First, he proposed that aggregate consumer spending was related to disposable income. His, quotes, fundamental psychological law, unquote, was that of a, of a, of a chunk of, a, of additional income, people would save some but spend a large fraction and this fraction he called the marginal propensity to consume. This principle gets away from the microeconomic analysis of spending and saving based on maximizing utility and looking at the effects of interest rates and inflation on the optimal allocation of spending over time. Secondly, he argued that um, cutting wages 
even in an economy where many workers were unemployed, was very difficult because it injured their sense of fairness. It would be a slow and painful process running into stiff opposition. As each firm cut wages and the workers, the workers involved would see their wages being cut relative to those of workers in other firms. Cutting wages, in, should it be necessary, in his view, could be done more equitably and more easily by allowing prices to rise while money wages stayed the same. Thirdly, he regarded the stock market as a kind of casino where the prices of stocks were determined not by fundamentals, i.e. the capitalized value of a firm's stream of expected future earnings, but by the values that investors thought that other investors were setting on firms. He wrote that it was like one of the beauty contests advertised in the newspapers of the time in which, to quote Keynes, it's not a case of choosing those faces that to the best of one's judgment are really the prettiest, nor even those that average opinion gen genuinely thinks are the prettiest. We have reached the third degree where we divert our intelligences to anticipating what average opinion expects the average opinion to be. And there are some, I believe, who practice the fourth, fifth, and higher degrees. That's a quote from the general theory of 1936. And fourthly, um, Keynes argued that investment was driven by the animal spirits, his expression, of the entrepreneurs. He wrote, even apart from the instability due to speculation, there's the inst instability uh, due to the characteristic of human nature that a large proportion of our positive activities depend on spontaneous optimism rather than on mathematical expectation, whether uh, moral or hedonistic um, <laughs> or economic. Most probably of our decisions to do something positive, the full consequences of which will be drawn out over many days to come, can only be taken as a result of animal spirits of a spontaneous urge to action rather than inaction, and not as the outcome of a weighted average of quantitative benefits multiplied by quantitative possibilities. From the present vantage point, these ideas look remarkably prescient and have been revived in some of the behavioral models that have been developed more recently. But in the 1950s and 60s, there was a gradual pushback against Keynes's ideas, and they were gradually dismissed as being ad hoc, not based on sound microeconomic foundations. Describing something in economics, describing something as ad hoc is really the worst, um, the worst thing you can say about it. It should be said. So let me say about something about the a sort of quick sketch of the um, neoclassical pushback against macroeconomics. But meanwhile, here is a photograph of um, John Maynard Keynes um, with his light wife um, Lydia Lopakova. Um, in the in the 1920s, so Keynes, the the hero of our piece, and um, we'll have a little we'll have a little peek at Milton Friedman um, in a second. There he is, That's Milton, who uh, whose views were really very much opposed to those of Keynes. In terms of the neoclassical pushback against Keynesian macro, Friedman led the way in the 50s and 60s. His permanent income hypothesis of consumer spending, along with the life cycle hypothesis due to Brumberg and Migliani, moved away from Keynes's simple model and in introduced the idea that consumers planned when deciding how much to spend to smooth it spending out over the years ahead. A perfectly sensible idea, of course. People receiving an increase in income might then be likely to save the bulk of it and spend little. Friedman criticized Keynes's neglect of the long-run consequences of public borrowing, noting that persistent borrowing would increase the size of the national debt, raising the cost of paying the interest on it, and increasing the government's temptation to monetize the debt, eventually causing higher inflation. Keynes hadn't paid much attention to inflation in the general theory, but it became an issue in the 50s, you know, after years of full employment. The Phillips curve, an empirical relation showing that the rate of inflation was higher when the unemployment rate was lower, um, <clears throat> based on data over 100 years, um, had been added to um, the Keynesian model in 1958. It seemed to provide um, a menu of choice for governments between lower unemployment accompanied by slightly higher inflation or higher unemployment accompanied by lower inflation. 
Friedman argued that this could only be, however, this could only be a short run choice, and that in the long run, inflation would either grow ever higher if the unemployment rate was kept too low or would progressively fall if unemployment was too high. At only run one rate would inflation remain constant in the long run, and this Friedman called the natural rate of unemployment. Friedman was skeptical of government intervention in the economy. Fiscal fine tuning, adjusting public spending to um, control unemployment, was in his view likely to fail and was maybe counterproductive because the time taken to diagnose the economic situation, to devise policies to restore full employment, to implement those policies, and for those policies to take effect was so long that by the time the original problem, by the time, by that time, uh, by that time, the original problem might have gone away or been reversed. A policy aimed at restraining a boom might end up making a recession deeper. Because of this, Friedman argued that the best policy for maintaining steady growth with low inflation was to get the money supply to grow at a steady rate, his so-called K% percent rule, where K should be the trend rate of growth of GDP plus the target rate of inflation. The broad thrust of Friedman's arguments was that government intervention in the economy was a bad thing and that the economy would readjust itself and move back to equilibrium without assistance. Basically, this was a reassertion of the pre-general theory state of economics. The, the pushback continued in the 70s when the rational expectations revolution swept through the discipline. This was the theory that forecasts of things like future inflation rates, returns on assets, exchange rates, interest rates, and so on, should be modeled as if based on all information, including knowledge of how the economy actually works. An idea that sounds simple and very sensible, and indeed it is, has the effect of further reinforcing the view that there's no need for government intervention to stabilize the economy. And it also leads to the result that government and central bank actions can't do anything useful to stabilize the economy. The, um, the reaction against Keynesian analysis uh, reached its peak in the early 1980s um, when Kidland and Prescott produced their paper, Time to Build an Aggregate Fluctuations, in which they modeled the business cycle in the United States as the consequences of random shocks to productivity. Uh, this is the real business cycle theory. Um, they model the economy as a perfectly competitive market economy populated by rational, well-informed households, maximizing their utility by choosing hours of work and spending patterns. It, it's a world where money is purely available. It doesn't affect the real economy at all and makes no appearance in the economy. Uh, the model is entirely real. The fluctuations in the economy are Pareto efficient, to use a bit of jargon. No public policy can make somebody better off without making someone else worse off. There is no reason in this world for government intervention at all. Implicitly, wages and prices are perfectly flexible. Supply equals demand everywhere, all the time. Any unemployment is voluntary. If people choose, it, it, during the recession, a recession involves people not working. That's interpreted in this model as people choosing not to work or working fewer hours because real wages are temporarily low. Um, in the background, there are sophisticated financial markets in which all risks can be traded. The real business cycle models, in fact, turn macroeconomics completely on its head. Instead of business cycles driven by aggregate demand, as in Keynes, as in the Great Depression, with swathes of the economy, capital and labor lying idle for want of demand, the real business cycle models portray booms and recessions as being due to changes in aggregate supply, changes in the productive potential of the economy. This paper unleashed an enormous research program that involved building these real business cycle models of successively greater refinement aimed at giving a better account of actual, a more, a more accurate account of actual fluctuations in, in the United States uh, economy. And there's our friend Milton Friedman again. Um, <clears throat> To, let me uh, to um, just to um, complete this little um, 
romp through um, the development of ideas in macroeconomics. Let me say a word or two about New Keynesian macroeconomics and the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. Following real business cycle models, sub subsequent research has stepped back from the extreme, extreme position on the causes and effects of business cycles and has reintroduced some imperfections into the model, such as sticky wages and prices and imperfect competition. Fluctuations in the economy um, can arise from random shocks hitting it. But now government and central bank can yield modest improvements in well-being. The use of interest rates can influence the inflation rate. These models, known as DSGE models, dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium models, have come to dominate macroeconomic modeling in many central banks and have become the norm in academic research. With this large, within this large class of models, those which incorporate elements of wage and price stickiness and imperfect adjustment are these new Keynesian models. The, these models have some Keynesian features, as the name implies, typically embodying slow adjustment of wages and prices so that supply does not always equal demand in all markets in the economy. Unemployed resources can emerge in these models uh, and, can, and policy can be used. Uh, monetary policy has, can have real effects and can be used to mitigate um, fluctuations. But in contrast um, to old Keynesian models, the departures from perfectly functioning competitive markets are based on what can be regarded as firm microeconomic foundations. Assumptions of the kind made by Keynes in the general theory are dismissed as ad hoc. These models still assume typically that consumers are rational agents who maximize utility. Preferences are assumed to be fixed and unchanging. A frequently assumed simplifying assumption is that all households in the economy are the same. There's a so-called representative households. Um, I come back to that. Um, the trouble with um, DSGE modeling is that um, it has a, a growing air of unrealism. It has unrealism. <laughs> it has attracted particular attention after the 2008-2009 global financial crisis, um, when DSGE models were seen to have um, offered very um, misleading advice. Olivier Blanchard writes of DESGE models that they are based on unappealing assumptions, not just simplifying assumptions, as is necessary in any model, but assumptions profoundly at odds with what we know about consumers and firms. He assesses the methods by which they are estimated, a mixture of so-called calibration and Bayesian estimation as being unconvincing. This is probably a legacy of Milton Friedman's prescriptions in a highly influential 1953 paper on the methodology of positive economics, in which Friedman argued that the value of a theory should be judged by the truth of its predictions, not by the descriptive realism of its assumptions. And consequently, much macroeconomic theorizing ha has gone much too far in building highly elaborate models on highly implausible assumptions. Uh, since the global financial crisis, there, there's been a... Um, Perhaps I could I should just um, ad address my, the the um, comments I put on this slide here um, that um, Paul Romer, who's one of the many critics of uh, macroeconomics, wrote in nineteen sixty in in two thousand and sixteen that um, one of the problems with macro uh, with the SGE models is that they've become um, they've modeled business cycles as being driven by a, a group of a bunch of imaginary shocks, not by the activities of any actual people or economic agents. And um, he lampoons this by saying, well, it's as if the business cycle is driven by these mythical beasts, phlogiston, which increases productivity, a troll who makes random changes to wages, a gremlin who makes random price changes to the prices of goods, and ether, which increases the risk preferences of investments, investors, and caloric, which makes people want less leisure and to work hard. Um, so he regards um, uh, 
macroeconomics um, in its manifestation through DSGE models as being absurd, in, if you like, and um, to attribute um, uh, the ups and downs of the business cycle and unemployment to these mythical um, impersonal forces which nobody can control. And obviously he thinks that's um, uh, a bad thing. And, and, and his view is that um, for three decades now, economics has gone backwards. Um, their, their models attribute fluctuations in aggregate variables to imaginary causal forces that, that are not um, reflective of actions of any that any person takes. Um, since, the, since the global financial crisis, um, there, there have been um, a number of initiatives taken uh, to address the perceived weaknesses of um, these dominant strains of macroeconomics. Um, in, in terms of teaching economics uh, in universities, there's uh, the core project has tried to revitalize the subject by putting issues of uh, practical questions ahead of developing a body of theory and by introducing more descriptive realism uh, in the into the analysis. It's a project, um, a very successful project um, to rewrite economics textbooks led by um, Samuel Bowles and Wendy Carlin, Wendy Carlin of University College London. Um, the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK um, set up a large uh, research program called Rebuilding Macroeconomics in 2017 to look at um, uh, contributions from a wide range of disciplines. And um, uh, the George Soros contributed $50, 50 million dollars to the Institute of New Economic Thinking, um, which was aimed at putting research on a different track with more interdisciplinary work um, and aiming to challenge conventional wisdom in economics. Well, that was perhaps quite a long detour um, around the uh, development of economics, but um, the, the the thrust of that was that e economics, if you like, started out being pretty macroeconomics, started out being pretty behavioral with Keynes. Then it was then the kind of neoclassicals um, pushed back and sort of swung the pendulum the other way, and then gradually um, the pendulums may be swinging back in the other direction, and that um, the the, uh, the extension of um, more behavioral um, economics into macro would be um, a, a further movement uh, back in that uh, direction. So let me speak about um, a little bit about behavioral uh, economics. Um, <clears throat> behavioral economics is, is an enormous body of research and a, a gathering body of research that shows that people do not behave like so-called homo economicus. What is or was homo economicus? It's a fictitious creation. The archetypal rational economic man or person uh, whose choices of work, leisure and all activities, consumption of goods and services, savings, investments and so on, can be understood as the solution of a problem. The problem of how to maximize the value of a utility function, taking into account the constraints on his or her actions. Utility functions widely used in economics assume that utility depends only on his or her own actions. Um, uh, utility functions are fixed and do not evolve over time or because of a person's experiences or interactions with other people. I'm sure no, no one believes that this is literally true, but it's taken as a useful working assumption for economic analysis. Um, it's assumed that changes in preferences that take place as time passes do not significantly affect the analysis. Economics is unusual among the social sciences in treating preferences in this way. One peculiarity is that there's no discussion in economics of where preferences come from. The question of how they're formed is generally viewed as not being economics. It's a subject for psychology or sociology or some other um, social science uh, discipline. Economics may cling to fixed and unchanging preferences because it forms the basis of welfare economics, i.e. normative economics. If preferences are constant, then a change in the maximum value of the utility function that a rational person can achieve because of some change in circumstances or change in activities, like a reduction of hours of work 
or less spending and more saving for the future, or some intervention by government, like a change in tax rates or public spending, uh, that, um, that can be used to judge whether the change is for the better or for the worse, and by how much. But if preferences evolve over time or reflect a person's position in the social hierarchy or other influences, or if behavior is such that it cannot be represented by a function that's maximized at all, then the basis for normative economics is swept away. It becomes much more difficult or impossible to say whether some change or other is an improvement or not. Many strands of research in behavioral economics show that the assumptions of homo, economics, homo economicus are invalid. Let me turn to the topic of um, time, so-called time inconsistency, which um, develop, and, and develops this theme. A striking uh, instance of, um, if you're bad planning, if you like, is that um, people are bad at planning for the future. Uh, instant pleasures are hard to resist. Deferred gratification is hard to practice. People systematically don't save enough for old age and they regret it when it's too late. It's such an ancient and well-known issue and such a massive potential problem that governments routinely intervene with social insurance and forced saving schemes. <clears throat> um, it may be a bigger problem in Western societies where people seem to be less thrifted than in Asian economies, if one may be permitted a rather coarse generalization. But on the other hand, it is true that um, Singapore uh, for example, has a central provident fund, which is a forced savings scheme, um, despite um, the Singaporean population being uh, thrifty. So it's, it's pretty much a universal issue. Timing consistent, this, problem, this phenomenon of bad planning can be un understood in a number of ways. One is uh, by assuming that people don't discount the future at a constant proportional rate. Um, they don't practice exponential discounting but discount future events relative to present events more than they discount more distant future events relative to nearer future events, so-called parabolic discounting. It means, in effect, that the person is not the same person at different points in their life. The young person who puts off saving for old age is different than the old person who regrets youthful profligacy. Whose utility is then appropriate? Uh, the appropriate judge of the effects of public policy and other changes, the young person who discounts old age heavily or the old person who doesn't. Bounded rationality is another um, um, <clears throat> uh, way in which um, these, phenom these phenomenons might, phenomena might be understood. It may be that people don't optimize, but adopt conventional behavior or follow simple rules of thumb about saving and spending. They may be satisficing, i.e. making decisions that achieve a satisfactory account outcome without worrying about whether it's optimal or not. And this goes back to Herbert Simon at the University of Chicago, who coined the word in 1956 as part of his theory of bounded rationality. Um, so this, uh, this element of behavioral economics is not exactly a new thing. It's been around for quite a long time. So <clears throat> besides this, um, um, social conventions and norms of behavior influence people. Norms might not tend to change despite underlying circumstances. One example is hours of work, where there are conventional patterns of full-time work. We speak of normal working hours or normal office hours. Some people have to or choose to work unsocial hours in the evenings, um, overnight or weekends, public holidays. There are normal patterns of holidays and travels. One of the many questions that are asked about working hours is why they differ between countries in ways that don't uh, correspond to differences in wealth, income, or wages. Um, there's, there's a popular idea that, you know, Americans are workaholics and um, Europeans are much keener on their holidays. Um, another question is why have working hours not fallen much as uh, incomes have grown? Patterns of spending and saving uh, and taste for particular goods may also be affected by the desire to be seen as a member of a group or a person of taste and fashion. Fans and fashions affect demand for particular goods. Advertising plays a big role. J.K. Galbraith in his Affluent Society, his book, 1958 book, said of, America, of American industry and consumer society that wants are increasingly created by the process 
by which they are satisfied. Conspicuous consumption is an idea that goes back to Thorsten Veblen, Thorsten Veblen in 1899. Um, Keynes pondered uh, the continued high, high, um, uh, high uh, Keynes pondered continued long working hours back in 1928. In a paper called Economic Prospects for Our Grandchildren, he observed that with 2% real growth per year, real incomes would have increased eightfold in a hundred years, which is approximately now, of course, and wondered how long people might be working there. He guessed 15 hours a week, 15 hours of work per week would be enough to satisfy most needs. And he wondered how people would spend all the leisure. And yet in 2024, hours of work remain much higher than that throughout the developed world. Um, Jan de Vries, an eco economic historian at UC California, Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley has written of the industrious revolution that led, led to greater hours of work in the 18th century and the possibility of a new industrious revolution that keeps us working long hours despite higher incomes. And a complementary view as to why hours of work remain so high is that people are concerned partly about status and their position in social and economic hierarchy. They're concerned about relative income um, and spending. Uh, and to the extent this is true, it leads people generally to work too hard. Everyone could be made better off by working less hard and earning less. As I said, uh, this, th these ideas go back to Thorstein Veblen in his theory of the leisure class of 1899. The view that uh, relative income matters rather than absolute income for people's happiness is supported by findings that reported happiness does not increase as much as income as populations become more prosperous, although happiness does increase with relative income. This finding known as the Easterlin paradox goes back to 1974, and it reinforces the idea that to the extent that utility can be inferred from statements about happiness, it depends on the consumption of, and incomes of other people, not just the individual concerned. It undermines the economic practice of so-called methodological uh, individualism. Um, to summarize, the evidence uh, uh, that people have preferences that change over time under social influence do not optimize consistently or do not optimize at all, but satisfies all serve to undermine normative economics. They make it much harder to judge amongst different economic situations. And and this and this is a pervasive feature of behavioral economics: the fact that social influences on preferences um, exist, and the fact that the well-being of other people enters into the preferences uh, and and decisions made by um, individuals. <clears throat> Another prominent um, theme in um, in in develop in, in behavioral economics is prospect theory. Um, which has, was developed by um, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky in 1979, based on findings that people generally find a loss of income or wealth much more painful than gaining the same amount. They have what is known as people suffer from loss aversion. People evaluate gains and losses relative to benchmark, often their own recent income or that of people in a reference group. Again, it implies that over time people adjust um, to circumstances. And again, this theory implies that utility is something changeable that evolves over time. The same level of income gives different amounts of utility depending on an individual's circumstances. So I've, I've um, dwelt here on ideas and evidence that question the assumption that preferences are fixed and immutable and depend only on the individual's consumption and leisure. But there are many, many other aspects of behavioral economics, which obviously I can't possibly um, go into here. So let me, um, uh, but I hope that what I've done is I, I listed at the beginning some um, uh, some of the many um, aspects of um, and findings in behavioral economics. And I hope, uh, and I've, uh, I've dwelt largely here on um, uh, things which uh, undermine the idea of fixed and immutable preferences, because that does seem to me um, 
a feature which really has profound implications for uh, macroeconomics and economics in general. So let me make a few offer a few um, mark, remarks by way of conclusion. Um, so despite decades of development and the proliferation, proliferation of instances in which people's behavior departs markedly from rationality, backed up by compelling evidence, social and behavioral economics has made relatively modest inroads into the mainstream of the subject. The new Keynesian DSGE model remains remarkably resilient. It provides a conceptual framework for macroeconomics that can be stripped down to three equations. An aggregate demand curve that explains demand in terms of past demand, expected future demand, and real interest rates. A Phillips curve that explains inflation as depending on past inflation, expected future inflation, and the pressure of aggregate demand. And thirdly, a monetary policy rule, a measure of the uh, and a measure of, uh, sorry, a, me a monetary policy rule, which explains how interest rates are set depending on aggregate demand and inflation. This is the so-called Taylor rule, um, which summarizes the way in which central banks in the United States and elsewhere typically um, set interest rates in order to try to achieve a target rate of inflation. And that, that three equation model has proved very, very um, durable. Uh, these equations can be derived from microeconomic foundations, i.e. optimizing households who, who choose consumption optimally and plan for the future, firms who set prices optimally at random intervals, and a central bank that sets interest rates to keep inflation under control. Whilst this model contains much that is broadly true and has attra some attractive features, it provides a highly e idealized account. Its appeal may derive from its providing a quantitative model that can be estimated statistically and in principle tested against data. It offers a, in quotes, hard analysis in a sense elaborated by George Akerlof in a recent paper on the, the sins of omission and the practice of economics, in which Akerlof argues that economics as a discipline, economics as a discipline favors topics that can be addressed in a so-called hard way with algebraic models, quantifiable concepts, and propositions that can be tested statistically. By contrast, much behavioral economics is not hard in this sense, but soft. Akerlof argues that this preference for hardness has left economics biased against new ideas, over-specialized, and obsessed with publishing in a top five set of journals. To this, he attributes several failures of economics, several sins of omission, including the failure to predict the 2008 global financial crisis and of narratives, stories that people tell each other about the economy and the way they infect the behavior and the way the economy evolves. Uh, and, and these are examples of important ideas, but ones which have not been explored enough or integrated adequately into the mainstream. So whilst social and behavioral analysis is much to contribute to macro, it seems likely to remain on the sidelines in the short term but at the same time, it's surely important to continue to challenge the many empirical failures of the dominant theory and to develop alternatives. Um, as I've, let me end where I began by noting that there's been a clear cycle, in my view, in macroeconomics. Um, Keynes's model in 1936 included key behavioral features. Um, so the neoclassical reaction against it led to a restoration of micro principles in macro and an attempt to reintegrate macro and micro so that macro would be distinguished from micro by the questions it deals with, but not by the models it uses. And the high point of this movement was the prominence of real business cycles in the early 1980s. The later the move towards reintroducing market imperfections, allowing for imperfect competition, et cetera, is a cautious move back to pragmatism and descriptive realism, albeit um, with what are regarded as sound micro foundations. Finally, more radical moves incorporating more behavioral insights, if at the expense of losing some of the hard focus in favor of softer elements, I would argue needs to come next. So I will end there. So thank you very much uh, for listening to me, ladies and gentlemen. Right. So thank you very much, John. Uh, now we ask uh, Stobo to offer some comments.
Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm Tsutomu Watanabe from University of Tokyo. Uh, actually, I was a big fan of uh, John's paper when I was a graduate student, and he was a very influential uh, producer of uh, very influential papers I, 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 at that time. So I, I led, I, I spent uh, many, many hours or many, many nights to understand what he wanted to say and if, if there is any way to expand his theory and so on. He was a, you know, sort of a star in the mainstream economics. <laughs> but today I'm hearing a different story and really enjoy his presentation. So my task as a, as a, a discussant is to may, maybe um, put everything, what he said in a wider perspective so that the people can understand uh, his statement, uh, his message very uh, um, if, in an efficient way. However, he um, covered many, many uh, important issues and uh, probably it's, it's impossible for me to cover all those issues. Uh, my ability cannot, uh, is not allow, allow me to do so. So, um, uh, so the strategy I, I, I was, I'm thinking about today is to focus on one particular um, item he mentioned and, uh, and try to um, uh, say that uh, that uh, item is very important as an, uh, in, the, in the area of macroeconomics. But at, at, at the same time, I'd like to argue that that issue is very um, useful and uh, very important even to uh, people um, outside the uh, university. So um, that's, that's, what, that's my strategy today. So let me share my screen. Okay, uh, so this is an um, abstract of, of his presentations. And, um, um, and he used terminology social norms. And this is an uh, 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 um, one item I'm gonna focus on in my presentations. Okay, so um, in the rest of my talk, um, I, first I just to uh, say something about what is a social norm. I, I, I understand that nobody is fa not familiar with, with this terminology, so I, I have to say something about it. And uh, based on that understanding, I have to say um, more about uh, how it is useful in the context of macroeconomics, and in particular in the context of monetary policy decision making here in Japan. That, that, that's what I, I will talk about. So what is a social norm? And so this is a, um, um, a quote uh, from, uh, from a paper by, by Professor Young uh, in, the, in 2015. And this is a, a survey paper about the social norms. Okay, so, that, um, so uh, social norms are the sort of unwritten codes and informal understandings that define what we expect of other people and what they expect of us. So, the, so here, um, essence is that uh, we, we, when we do our daily life, we have to expect what other people will do. Otherwise, so we we, we live, but uh, not we, we are living in an uh, isolated uh, island. We live in a society, so we have to understand what people will do. So, based on that um, expectation, we have to make our decision. So. The, there is sort of uh, um, uh, element in uh, game theory, sort of game theory, game theoretical element already embedded in this in this uh, uh, in this uh, statement. And um, social norms establish styles of dress and uh, decorum, obligations to family members, property rights, uh, contractual contractual relationship, and so on. So everything uh, um, is. Uh, uh, in our, uh, in our daily life is closely related to social norms. So this is a, um, a sort of broad definition what the social norm means. One, let me give you one um, you know, funny example. So this is a, 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 a Tokyo and Osaka. And um, this is a, 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 so you can see that in Tokyo, Everybody stand. Uh, it is a station, right? And uh, in Tokyo, everybody stands on 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 the on the on the left. And uh, if people are really in a hurry, uh, then they will go to the right. So this is a, a social norm in Tokyo area. However, if you go to Osaka, you have a different thing, and people stand on the right. And if people if you have, if people are hurry, they, then they will go to the, go to the left. That's a social norm in Osaka. 
important thing is that a uh, government in Tokyo or government in Osaka do not do this kind of regulation. So uh, this, is not, this is nothing to do with the government. This is just uh, also this is nothing to do with uh, uh, station companies and so on, railway companies and so on. Actually, railway company often say that uh, please do not work on on the on the on the on the on the, uh, on, the, on, the uh, on, on the steps and so on. so uh, so uh, no one uh, government um, uh, uh, just, uh, 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 companies are. Uh, 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 making this sort of rule, but people themselves create this sort of rules by themselves. So this is the social norm. In particular, uh, uh, easiest example of uh, social norms. So, the, so, if you, so you, now you can uh, uh, imagine many, many types of different social norms in your, in your daily lives. Uh, however, uh, of course, this is still not so much related to economic economic activities. So I need to do uh, I need to say more about how this social norm is related to the to the economic activities. And um, here, this, so this is a picture of a governor uh, governor of BOJ uh, Kuroda, and he left the Bank of Japan. Very recently, so he he started uh, ten years ago his tenure, his term, and ended uh, March tenth th this year. So he is uh, just uh, saying uh, uh, goodbye to to everybody, and uh, he made uh, his final um, um, uh, statement at the end of his his term. And uh, uh, by the way, uh, he want what he wanted to do in, initially was to end deflation. So the, um, Japan was suffering from deflation for more, more than two decades. So um, uh, Governor Kuroda wanted to end deflation. So he did some um, uh, special uh, policies. He adopted special policies and tried to escape from deflation. But unfortunately, the policy was not did not work very well. So still, um, uh, Japan is, uh, has to struggle with uh, deflation. So in, in some sense, his policy was not successful. And so he has to say something about why he, he was not able to uh, end deflation and, and, and this uh, message here uh, closely related to that, uh, that thing. He said that there was um, um, a persistent norm of thinking and practice based on the assumption that wages and prices will not change. So people, Japanese people strongly believe that wages will not change at all in the future. Also, they believe that prices will not change uh, in, the, in the future. So those uh, uh, assumptions or, or expectations held by the people uh, is, a, um, uh, is a sort of norm, social norm. And he, what he said is that this was, um, uh, so he tried to destroy this, this social norm because he, uh, otherwise he, uh, he will not be able to uh, end def deflation. So um, his, his strategy was to, uh, to destroy this norm and uh, try to uh, cre uh, create a new norm uh, so in, in, a, uh, in, in which uh, prices and wages are expected to rise uh, in a stable way. So, but, but he was not able to destroy the social norm. So in some sense, his policy was a sort of fight against the social norms, okay? And, uh, and, uh, and his, his attempt uh, is a sort of very um, good e evidence that it's very hard to change social norms once it is deeply uh, embedded in the society. As I said, uh, we had a deflation. Um, uh, deflation itself started the late 90s. So we already spent more than two decades. And that's why people are very much accustomed to the uh, circumstances that the prices and wages will not, do, do not change at all. And that's why people expect that the prices and wages will not change at all uh, in the future. So that this is a very strong uh, norm, a, a persistent norm embedded in the Japanese society. And um, I, he uh, also, um, so uh, he also made a several sp um, statement about this norm, and he called it zero inflation norm. 
and uh, even in the, in the Congress and so on, he made he used this uh, this terminology and try to uh, you know try to explain what he he tried to do. And Governor uh, Kuroda uh, left the BOJ in March this year, but still new 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 people. Uh, for example, uh, Deputy Governor Shinichi Uchida uh, very recently said men mentioned about uh, about social norm, and there is a very persistent uh, no social. There exists a persistent no social norm uh, here in Japan, and people expect that the wages and prices will not change in the future. And so it, see, he emphasized that it's quite uh, difficult to, to 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 change this sort of uh, social norm. But they, uh, they, they but uh, they have to uh, um, that so that they have to uh, develop some sort of new technologies or new uh, policy to 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 eliminate this sort of social norms. So that, that was a statement by the current governor, uh, current deputy governor Shinji Uchida. So so this social norm issue, a uh, zero inflation norm issue, is still a uh, um, uh, our daily uh, life. Uh, issues and still Bank of Japan and the government of uh, Japanese government are struggling with this uh, with this uh, social norm. And um, so um, so now I, I'm I'm gonna uh, move on to the uh, more casual issues and try to persuade uh, that the Japanese price wage norm is quite quite different from the rest of the world. And so that, so uh, so the um, uh, well, norm is always, uh, uh, in some sense, uh, in, in, uh, now in, in we are living in a global society. So most of the norms are shared by um, uh, by by uh, by 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 people in many many countries. But uh, um, as far as this uh, price wage norm is concerned, and uh, this norm exists only in Japan, and the rest of the world have a different norms or healthy uh, norms, and so that so that some very very stick, uh, very very strange behavior is observed uh, only in, in Japan, and uh, let, let me tell you something about it. So um, we do a, a sort of a consumer survey every year. And uh, so this is a, a survey result we, we did in the, in the past. So we, one of the questions we ask is, uh, what do you think will happen to prices in the next year compared to today? So we are trying to uh, 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 ask uh, inflation expectations. For example, UK, so uh, John is from uh, from UK. U UK is blue bar is uh, very uh, high. Blue bar means that uh, percentage of, of people who expect that price will, will increase a lot. Okay, and on the other hand, uh, red bar is very small, and red bar represents a, a fraction of people who expect that prices will remain more or less unchanged. On the other hand, so the, the same thing is true for US, uh, Canada, and Germany, but for Japan, you can clearly see a very, very uh, big difference. Um, for, uh, um, red bar is very high relative to the other countries, which means that um, uh, typically, typical Japanese people expect that prices will remain unchanged in the future. On the other hand, Japanese people do not expect that the price will increase a lot. So, the, so the, again, so the, already we can see that Japanese uh, consumers have a very, very different expectation than than the other the, than the rest of the, uh, the economy. Okay. Another um, um, funny episode. This is um, uh, uh, from New York Times in two, uh, 2016, and here this is a, a, a front page. And here I, I magnify this part and then to get this one. So those are the Japanese, and actually they are the. Uh, so he is a CEO and they are uh, as an executive of uh, um, ice cream bar companies, which is called uh, Akagi. Okay, and uh, they they uh, in 2016 they wanted to raise their prices because some um, material prices coming from China, uh, prices are increased a lot, so they have to raise their prices. And then uh, um, this company showed uh, in, in, on TV commercial, and uh, um, 
I'm sorry, I have to change our pricing. So they, they apologize to their customer on TV to raise their prices. Okay. And uh, probably the reporter of the New York Times uh, found, found, look at the, at the uh, TV and uh, realize that uh, very different, very funny things are going on here in Japan. You know, if you go outside Japan, you know, cost increase, marginal cost is higher, then it is very natural for companies to pass through cost increase to their prices. So that's a fair pricing. So that fair is also the terminology John used in his presentation. So not, nothing but in, in raising prices in that in the circumstances. However, in Japan, um, it, it's it's not a it, it, it is believed to be a bad thing. So that's why CEO of a company have to say I'm sorry to the to, to the customers when they they try to raise their prices. So for, for Japanese people or people living in Japan, it is not so surprising, but uh, people living outside Japan, social norms about prices are quite different. So um, for, for, for those people, this is a very strange phenomenon, only, only observed in Japan. Another funny thing is, is this one. So th this is a pro so what, what we call product downsizing. So this is a chocolate and uh, chocolate used to be this size, but now it's, it's getting smaller. So this is a cheese, and uh, 2015, uh, it contains 108 gram, uh, I'm sorry, uh, sorry, in 1994, it contains 170 gram, but 2009, it, re it reduced to 120, and uh, furthermore, 108 gram, without changing price at all. Nominal price doesn't change at all, but the it, uh, product itself is shrinking. This is toilet paper, and <laughs> actually the same thing is happening here, and the uh, uh, price does not change at all. Nominal price doesn't change at all, but the quantity uh, itself is shrinking. So we, so people living in this country face this sort of phenomena uh, in, in the daily in life quite often, and some consumers get angry, or some consumers uh, feel very sad looking at this sort of thing. But anyway, um, uh, the issue is that companies uh, cannot raise their prices because uh, customers refuse to to do so, and that's why they have to change change uh, their quantity or quality without changing their prices. So the, again, this is a very strange phenomena for, uh, specific for Japan. And uh, this is the, uh, due, due, uh, uh, this happened due to the, due to the um, strange social norms uh, uh, existing in Japan. Okay, so far we, I, I'm talking about um, uh, uh, zero inflation norm. But uh, actually, um, uh, uh, something different is going on um, since uh, uh, the spring of 2022. So two years ago, something happened. And now we have a facing a higher prices and we have a higher wages and so on. And so there are some signs of change in the Japanese price wage norm. And uh, so, so, so let, let me say something about this. So uh, again, this is a um, uh, result from a survey. And it's, uh, I, I showed this one already uh, about 2022. And you can clearly see that red bar is much lower than before. The red bar was very high in 2021, but now it's much lower than before. And it's almost uh, the same as, as in, in uh, other countries. And blue bar instead is now higher than before, and the height of blue bar is almost the same as other other countries, which means that inflation expectation is almost the same uh, in, in Japan. I'm sorry, Japanese consumers' inflation expectation is almost almost the same as consumers in the other countries, and similar thing was observed in 2023. So people started to change their expectations, or people started to change their social norms. And uh, probably this is a good chance for us to change our social norm, and uh, maybe a good chance to end our deflation period. 
I don't know. Um, I'm not quite sure that whether that will happen or not. But my point, uh, as a, a discussion to John's um, presentation, is that um, social norm is not um, a very special issue, not, uh, studied by only by academic people. It's not true. Uh, it's a very important issue for for people living in the real world and. Uh, Policy decision making is closely related to the to, to this issue. That's my my point. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, John, would you like to respond to uh, Thomas? Uh, yes, Thomas. Yes, by all means. Yes, uh, uh, to Thomas. Thank you very much for your very generous um, comments, um, especially about um, early research I did many many um, years ago. And I'm sorry that you had to wrestle. <laughs> with uh, trying to understand uh, the mysteries of it, but um, yes, you're of course you're right in a way that um, I'm, I've become a I've become an old dog who is um, singing a rather different tune mm. than than, than uh, I did as a, a younger a, a younger scholar. But um, uh, there we are. I mean, it is true. I mean, uh, I, I I think you know the the kind of research I did. Um, back in the 1980s, I was, I was fortunate enough, um, you know, it, it received a lot of attention, um, was um, it was a reflection of the extraordinary um, power of the rational expectations mm. hypothesis mm -hmm. when it um, when it sort of burst on the scene, mm. really from the um, mid, mid or late 1970s mm -hmm. onwards, and uh, it really did um, cause the most enormous uh, change mm. in um, in macroeconomic modeling and um, and theorizing and um, so you know we were all kind of trying to mm. get to grips with that and, and and work out the consequences so it did cause a, a huge amount of um, of excitement um, back then so it is true I've, um, <laughs> I've my, I'm seeing a different tune slightly in this uh, in this talk today but this is uh, you know many it's uh, decades later unfortunately. Um, I, I can I say I, I mean I like very much your um, your example of um, of the power of, of social norms mm -hmm. um, uh, in holding down inflation in Japan despite the best efforts of the of the central bank mm -hmm. the Bank of Japan to um, to raise inflation which I know it's been trying to do it for twenty odd years hasn't mm -hmm. it with um, with very limited um, um, success so I think I, I, th I think that's a very very lovely example um, of. of of social norms at work, mm. um, and um, I, I'm afraid my talk really was a little short on a good examples. <laughs> and, uh, and so this, this Maybe is you very can you the, <laughs> in the future. Yes, I will. I, I certainly will. Thank you very much. Um, but I, I want. Is it? Um, should one um, say? Um, how how do you distinguish between this being a social norm rather than a reflection of rational expectations? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that that's okay. I, that's what I I ought to ask yep. you. Yeah, you know, you you yeah. mentioned DSG yeah. in yeah. your presentation, yes. yeah. and, uh, and most young people at the BOJ, the economists and educated uh, here at the US yeah. Tokyo yeah. or some yeah. somewhere yeah. in the UK yeah. or US, they are pretty much familiar with DSG, based yeah. on yeah. rational expectation. Yeah. But uh, Governor yeah. Kuroda yeah. mentioned social norm yeah. instead of inflation expectation, right? Yeah. But so it's a very different situation uh, within the BOJ, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, policy making is not so easy because governor and uh, executive people believe social norm is very important and the inflation mm -hmm. rational expectation mm -hmm. is not a, is not a big issue for us. But uh, okay. young so, people have a different idea. Yeah. Do, do you think um, how to reconcile with those guys? Well, I think well, uh, the central banks are very concerned about public communication mm -hmm. and. Um, and speaking in language that the general public mm. are going to understand. And I, I take it that talking about rational expectations is going to cut no ice whatsoever. <laughs> it's going to mean nothing um, to the, the general public uh -huh. in Japan, but talking about social norms is. And um, I guess Japan is a country in which um, social norms are particularly powerful. Mm. Um, so I imagine this um, speaking in that, using that language uh, resonates uh -huh. um, very strongly. And, and I guess part of your point was that um, the fact that, um, you know, to the ex extent there's a difference, I mean, so to the extent that um, talking about social norms is not merely using 
different language mm. to describe the same phenomenon. Um, that uh, what happened in, in, in Japan is that this, um, you know, the belief in zero inflation mm. has become so deeply entrenched um, that, um, uh, you know, that uh, the people, you know, um, even if rational expectations mm. would have said that inflation expectations mm. should have risen a lot sooner, mm. um, um, they didn't change at all. And, I, and perhaps that this is something which has affected not only Japan but also mm. um, other countries, Europe and the United States as well, where after several decades of inflation targeting mm. by central banks, um, low inflation has become a firmly established mm. um, um, expectation or social norm um, that even efforts to um, to move in the inflation rate um, upwards is not, are not uh, mm. uh, have had met with very limited success by the by the central bank. So I thought it's a really nice example of, um, of the importance of social norms and the way in which they are important for macroeconomic policy. And, uh, macro uh, another question related yeah. to that. Uh, so I was educated uh, in the 90s, but uh, um, more, more senior guys educated in 60s or 70s, uh, they say that uh, when they talk, up, when they learn about the inflation or fifth scarf, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, social norms yeah. about inflation it was yeah. believed to be very important. That's okay. what that, that what uh, taught even in in the United States. Okay. And but my generation learns that uh, Phillips curve is uh, the location of the Phillips curve is determined by rational expectation. Yeah. So sometimes uh, maybe early seventies yeah. or uh, late sixties. Sometimes. Um, Academic people change the terminology, uh, switching from so so social norms to expectations. Is yep. this related to your presentation? Um, your rational yeah, expectation yeah. devolution, right? Yes. Um, well, I think it was uh, the rational expectations was such a powerful idea, mm. and and of course there um, there's a natural um, wish to. Um, uh, extend such an idea as mm. far as possible mm. and you know to explain as many economic phenomena as possible um with the um the simplest and most coherent mm. um set of concepts um so i i, I imagine that uh, you know in terms of you know uh, its connection with my remarks that um uh, the social norms were prob probably came to be regarded as some ad hoc uh -huh. uh, element uh -huh. in economic theorizing which ought to be replaced by rational expectations which you know um, back then people had you know, think mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s were thinking well this this has firm microeconomic foundations mm -hmm. based um, and uh, that sort of um, view of, of it and language should be promoted mm -hmm. um, i mean uh you know and it is true that the uh, the sort of standard uh, the mainstream paradigm um, it does offer this uh, very neat, um, coherent conceptual mm -hmm. framework, and that, which is one of the reasons mm -hmm. I think it's very difficult um, to dislodge. And, uh, you know, behavioral economics looks like a rag bag of, um, mm -hmm. of, of um, bits and pieces, really, which um, uh, hasn't really been able to um, make deep inroads. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Um, so do you have any more to, to, shall I just, um, sure. yeah, uh, get some of the questions. So, so this, this idea of social norm mm -hmm. is, um, very interesting <laughs> obviously, <laughs> to, to many people mm -hmm. outside of economics and, and in fact, I'm so glad that it's researching <laughs> in the field of economics, because how could we actually live in a society without really taking into account? what social norms are. And I have here a sort of perfect question for, which is related to this, um, this, uh, this idea and also the way uh, economics is discipline, thinks about um, issues uh, which uh, uh, of, of that kind. And so the question is, uh, this is from the audience, uh, is part of the problem uh, that prevents change in macroeconomic thinking is the fact that economics as a discipline tends to be siloed away from other uh, social sciences, rarely housed in the same department or faculty within universities, for example. A, 
uh, critiques of Homo economicus have a long pedigree in economic anthropology and economic sociology, but these critiques are rarely engaged by economists. Uh, do you see much potential for richer economic models developing through deepening cross-disciplinary engagement? So I think John first and Stomo. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I, uh, I accept. I mean, I think, I think the, the, um, the, the questioner is, you know, has, it's a nail on the head that it is true that, um, yeah, economists sort of sit on, in one place and um, sociologists and psychologists and anthropologists are sitting somewhere else and there's much too little interaction between them. Um, I mean, my own limited experience has been that, in, uh, that actually um, getting um, dialogue going between different um, groups, social scientists, social scientists from different disciplines is terribly hard work because we all do tend to speak different languages and have different preconceptions. Um, uh, and, and, and different focuses of interest. Um, uh, and it, it requires a lot of a, a determined and sustained effort um, to doing it. But yes, it would, it would be a beneficial, in my view, I think. And I, I, mean, I think that's the point that's being made by, by George Ackerwald, for example, a very distinguished um, economist and, um, and others mm -hmm. um, about, about the need for much, for much more of this. And, um, you know, and, and I think this problem that, um, you know, so, some macroeconomic modeling, you know, the DSGE type modeling, as Olivier Blanchard, another very influential economist, has, has uh, said, is based on unappealing um, assumptions, which don't conform at all to the way in what we know about the way that firms and households behave. Um, I, th I think, it, and, and it's given very misleading predictions. I think, um, I think there is um, a need to try to engage with other for economists uh, to engage with other social scientists and for there to be much more interdisciplinary research. And of mm. course, it's difficult partly because the um, you know, tenure and promotion criteria and publications criteria um, really uh, militate against it. So you're, you're up against quite a lot of um, opposition to do that. I, want, I mean, before we turn to Stomer, I just wonder that this behavioral turn yeah. is going to help us uh, push towards a more kind of uh, meaningful uh, cross discipline discussions, uh, mm. such that we are trying to do here mm. at Tokyo yeah. College as a as a as a place yeah. of uh, connecting um, ideas, um, uh, different yeah. uh, not just within social sciences, which is already yeah. difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, across, um, you know, radical disciplinarity across sciences and engineering and so on. So um, uh, I just wonder whether Tom has some yeah. Yeah, views on so, this. Um, first of all, I have to say that I'm uh, still a main, mainstream economist. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 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 so uh, however, I, I love to do uh, uh, joint work with uh, other other area people, in particular um, physics and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me say something about my experience with the joint work with those people. So um, so physics people are pretty much interested in economic phenomena. So Harding mm -hmm. or a crash or something like that. Those are very exciting phenomena for them. You know, complicated, complex uh, uh, system for them. So uh, they. To try to uh, um, deliver their own tools in in, in econ into economics to understand what's going on in the stock market and so on, and that's pretty new. And I, I'm very much excited about their approach. However, once they write some paper and send the paper to an economic journal, top five and so on, then uh, editor is not uh, look, never look at the paper at all. And then, uh, you know, early stage re uh, re rejected very quickly. And that sort of thing repeated many, many times. Maybe this is a bad aspect of the economics uh, so, uh, uh, society. Uh, as far as I know, sociology is much more flexible, accepting physics people. Of course, uh, bio, uh, bio, uh, biotechnology or medicine, those guys are pretty much uh, happy to work with uh, physics people, but uh, economists are not so happy to do so. It's the same thing. Another example is um, um, uh, 
uh, nowadays, um, uh, machine learning or deep learning or AI, those you know, technologies are now developing very, very, very quickly. And um, um, some of the professors in those areas quite interested in putting those things into economics. Again, economists are not happy to uh, see those new concepts, new technologies coming into the, their area. And uh, typically, they are refused to uh, get some new ideas from, from those guys. So maybe we should uh, uh, think about, maybe our economists should think about uh, not uh, trying to change uh, their attitude toward uh, outside economic people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure um, the rest of academia would be very happy to be discussing <laughs> more with economists um, by finding a sort of like um, more kind of broadly acceptable language yeah. uh, of communication. And, broadly understood. And, uh, yeah, understood mm, yeah. Uh, language of communication yeah. and, um, and so on. Now, I got some questions here, which actually, um, I don't know, how are we doing time-wise? Oh, we are actually running out of time, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so I'm terribly sorry because there are uh, sort of more specific questions related to um, Professor Watanabe Stomos' um, presentations about Japan. Um, but I think we have to, uh, unfortunately. Maybe I can contact him yes, or her yes, later. Yes, please, yeah. That Through email great. or. Yes, yes. Uh, we have a number of questions in the chat box. So. Um, well, thank you very much uh, to the audience for um, for your interest and um, wonderful questions. And we are very sorry that we we just simply ran out of time here today. And I'd like to thank um, John Driffle for a very thought provoking, um, uh, interesting, um, I guess, new topic of research. Um, and uh, Stomu Watanabe for. Um, wonderful empirically grounded <laughs> examples to match John's more kind of um, uh, conceptual um, uh, um, yeah. presentation on, on the idea of, uh, the, of the behavioral term. So thank you very much, everybody. And um, we, we hope to see you at the next um, uh, public webinar. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.